Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Christine Williams. You're listening to Fiber Talk, that twice weekly podcast for people who make the fine art with the needle in the thread. And well our, done. Our guest this week, she does that fine art thing, Allison Cole of Allison Cole Embroidery. Hi, Allison. Hi, guys. How are you? Welcome. Thanks for Thank doing me. this. Well, thank you for having me. And for the next hour, we get to listen to that beautiful Australian accent. It's going to be wonderful. (laughs) Thank you. Oh, it's the best. It's the best. Okay, now the report here says, the report here says that if I'm your, if I was your high school boyfriend and wanted to spend an evening sitting on a couch next to you, that there would be an embroidery stand in the way. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you, you'd have your legs underneath my frame, yep. <laughs> at, that point, at that time, I was working on pieces of canvas on a frame that was about four foot long, so I used to take up the entire lounge, and <laughs> anybody that wanted to sit beside me had to sit under my embroidery. So, <laughs> As a dad of a daughter, see, that would be a huge plus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, sit, sit yeah. with any boy you want. Go ahead, just any boy you want. Just, that's fine, yeah. Make, make sure you take your stitching, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, in just doing the background work, that was the, the thing. You started stitching when you were very young, and you haven't quit. No, I've been stitching for 40 years. <laughs> wow, wow. I mean, because you mentioned somewhere... Uh, kids even kind of made fun of you in school because you were always stitching. And... Yeah, they, they they made fun of me. I used to stitch. I had a 40, 45 minute trip to school on the school bus. So I used to stitch on the way to school and I used to stitch in my free periods and at lunchtime and I'd stitch on the bus on the way home from school. And um, the only time the kids didn't pick on me was when it was winter because I'd take a crocheted rug. I was crocheting a rug at one stage <laughs> and all my friends would sit under the rug. <laughs> and as I worked along it, they, they'd all turn it so that it would, um, it would move along. <laughs> <laughs> Allison, let me hold that for you. <laughs> uh. So, yeah, in the winter, my friends, I used to sit under the rug I was crocheting. So they used to, they used to pick on me the rest of the year, but at that point, they, they were quite happy with it. So That's, I mean, that's true. You know, for a, a kid, I mean, that's tremendous commitment, obviously, You've always enjoyed it, and it. But uh, even you know through school, I mean, at some point, I would expect you'd just set it aside for more, you know, for whatever kids do in school. But uh, well, I I set aside um, I set aside doing textiles at school, so I dumped textiles as quickly as I could, because my mum was a seamstress, and she used to say that my sewing teacher wasn't a seamstress as bootlace, and <laughs> while, while like. Well, I got um, lots. I never got a score below ninety-five percent for my for my textiles at school, and I had a, a few perfect hundreds. And I'd come home, and my mother would make me take it apart and remake it properly. So I stopped <laughs> doing textiles. <laughs> I stopped doing textiles, but I, I didn't stop stitching at home. And I've I've always stitched. And my mum and I used to joke. At one point, she'd say, "Well, I'm the better seamstress." I'd say, "Yes," and I'm the better embroiderer. So we just <laughs> leave it at that. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I, uh, I used to I, – it was always still my relaxation, even though um, I did business at school. So, um, it, you know, once you got your schoolwork finished, I would then still be stitching and doing things. Same way my daughter, she was doing um, all art subjects at school and then she'd come home and her favourite thing in the world was to draw. So she would come home and she still every night comes home from – well, she doesn't live here anymore, but she goes home and she, she draws of an evening because that's what she enjoys doing. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's 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 always been there, and even then when I got a job, um, I never used to take um, tea breaks because I don't drink tea or coffee. And so they'd say, "Oh, we'll just go out and sit out in the waiting room and just have a break for fifteen minutes." So I started taking my embroidery to work so I could do that. And um, at that time, I was doing embroidered um, pullovers, and. Um, the people at work would see them and they'd want to buy them. So as quick as I could embroider them, they were gone. So it was <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice it was a nice sideline. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> yeah. So it it is it, it's always been embroidery. Yeah, pretty much. Um, 
I'm, I've done, like, my, my great aunt taught me to crochet when I was 11. Um, my mum taught me to knit when I was five. So th- there's always been other things there, but they're not my priority. My priority is always, is always embroidery. Hmm. So, Any particular um, style or thing that you'd prefer? Um, I love, I've always, always loved gold work and stump work, but they were something that you couldn't learn. So, you know, at, growing up, it was just surface stitchery. I loved, loved surface embroidery, um, did canvas work, cross stitch, all the, all the sorts of things that everybody does. Um, Trapunto, you know, played, dabbled in a bit of everything. Um, but, you know, once I, um, got to join the Embroiderers Guild and find out, you know, it was the only place you could go to find out more about gold work and stump work. I was seeing in exhibitions and things like that, but not actually being able to find anywhere to learn how to do it. And up until that point, um, I was either self-taught or taught by my mum and everything. So, um, you know, it was a real um, amazing thing to be able to go out and do classes and learn things in a class and discover that there's somewhere out there that, that there are people teaching this. And then I accidentally fell into teaching it myself. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that's so, yeah, from what I read, there isn't really a class you haven't taken pretty much. No, pretty much. (laughs) I landed a job in a a needlework shop in, in my local needlework shop because I was there almost every day buying supplies. It was only five minutes away from where I lived. So it was a case of, Oh, I need a thread. Oh, let's just jump in the car and go get it. And, um, and so she, um, she'd find that while she was busy serving people, I'd be there helping other people at the counter and saying, Oh no, you just do this. or you do that or whatever. And, um, so she said, you know, you just have such a wide knowledge from all these classes that you've done and all the things you've done even before you joined the guild that, would you like to come and have a part-time job in the shop? So, and then would I like to teach? And so it just kind of snowballed. So um, <laughs> it was funny. What this one day, this lady came into the shop and she says to me, "Oh, you're not Sheree." And I said, "No, I'm Alison." And she goes, "Oh, you won't be able to help me. I need Sheree to help with my crochet, and you don't crochet." And I said, "Who says I don't crochet?" She said, "Oh, I've never seen you crochet." I said, "Doesn't mean <laughs> I don't." <laughs> I said, I just, did a full crochet layette for my daughter when she was born. <laughs> she, oh, okay. <laughs> and it was just that she was used to using English patterns and it was an American pattern, so a double crochet was a treble. So it was just something really, really simple. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was funny, though, because she was just ready to turn on a heel and walk out because I wasn't <laughs> the person she thought she needed. <laughs> and actually you were, yep. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, um, I specialise in gold work. Um, work because they're the things that I adore um, but I love doing creative embroidery I like doing things that are really left of center um, they're just not always things that you can teach or package into a kit form to put in so what I do for exhibitions and things is usually um, still incorporating gold work and stump work but usually very different to what I have on my website for sales so it's um, yeah I, I'm, I like to do things that are a little bit different I like to mix things up. Yeah. So when when you're you're teaching, I mean, you're you're teaching adults as essentially a a very young lady then. Yeah. <laughs> um, I started teaching uh, when I was started teaching embroidery when I was twenty seven. So it was um, a lot of you know, I was the youngest person in the guild when I joined, and I'm still probably in the lower ten percent <laughs> of it still. So <laughs> twenty years later. Bringing down uh, yes, that average, um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I used to say that when I was a kid, I was a junior member of the Horticulture Society and everybody I was hanging around, you know, I was my had a nursery. So I, um, I grew up around horticulture and um, so everybody I hung around with was sort of, you know, 60 and above. And then when I was 15, I started doing ballroom dancing and everyone I hung around with was 60 and above. <laughs> 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 then in my... 20s, I joined the Embroiderers Guild, and everyone I'm hanging around with is 60 and above. <laughs> and I, I'm still hanging around with people who are 60 and above. I just seem to be catching up to them really quickly. So. <laughs> yeah, that's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's going to happen. Well, no, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's been really fabulous. And interesting because, yeah, sometimes people would come into the classroom and they wouldn't realize I was the teacher. Um, because I was the youngest person in the room. Um, and sometimes I'd 
I'd be teaching, say, a, a intermediate certificate at the Guild, and I'd have ladies that think that they'd like to tell me how they thought the class should run because they've been in the Guild for years. <laughs> it's like, oh, oh yeah, and I'm the, te I'm the teacher and I'm the one answerable to the education community. So, you know, this is the way it's going to happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, um, so, yeah, I... I um, I don't really let too many people intimidate me very much. So. No, I wouldn't think at this juncture you would. No. 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 Yeah. <laughs> no. And, yeah. and that's, sometimes it, I have a care. Sorry, as I say, sometimes I have a care factor of zero. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I got to write that down. I, my care factor is zero. That's a good one. I can use that. So, yeah, no. Some some people think they they know so much more than you enter classroom and you know i if they don't know me i don't know how they think that they would know more than me so right that's um just because i'm young that doesn't mean i haven't done a lot of study and a lot of research and usually you know like i say these days i can tell i've been stitching for 40 years and they just look at me with their eyes wide open because <laughs> some people don't even think i'm 40 40 years old which is really nice because i'm way old <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. anyway yeah. Well, you did. Did you? I don't know if you went to college or not. I mean, did have you always had an artistic study, or was this always just something that you did in addition to? Yeah, no, I always did. I did business at school, and I didn't okay. even finish high school. Um, I wanted to work in an office. I wanted to um, type essentially. Uh, I wanted to type and and be a you know a, a clerk, and to do that here in Australia, you have to get in as a junior before you turn 18. And I was the oldest, because of the way my birthday fell in the school year, I was the oldest in the class and I was going to turn 18 halfway through my final year of high school. And so it was a case of, do I stay at school, get my certificate, then have to go on and become an accountant or something at university, um, or do I see if I can get in as a junior before I finish school? Um, because some of my friends turned 18 while they were at uni the following year. I turned 18 in high school. So I um, I started applying for jobs and I got the fifth one I applied for. So um, I've always worked in business. Um, so my parents had their own business. So I think it's always held me in really good stead for having my own business. A lot of embroidery teachers, um, it's not that they can't make a living out of what they, what they do. It's just that they don't have a business background to be able to organise it. So... Yeah. Um, I think it's been a really good thing to have that as a background. But embroidery is always, you know, I've always loved. Um, from before I was taught to stitch, I used to, um, my favourite thing in the world was just colouring in and cutting up pieces of paper and sticky tape and glue and scissors and staples. <laughs> and uh -huh. and I, I, still like, I still like stationery. But, <laughs> but, yeah, when I was a kid, that was, you know, mum, and, that, that would be a really good birthday present would be just a block of coloured paper, you know, that you could then go and <laughs> go nuts with. So <laughs> uh, That's, that's so, easy yeah. shopping. <laughs> yeah, and my daughter was pretty much the same. So, you know, she's um, she was doing um, – I put a needle in her hand when she was three. And um, by the time she was 10, she was doing kids' projects for a magazine here in Australia that I convinced them that if they could get rid of one frowsy – boring adult nana project that nobody really wants to stitch and put one kid's project in, you've got the next generation of stitches hooked. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the next generation of people are going to buy your magazine. And so um, one of the editors didn't agree to that. And then when the editor changed, the next editor said that would be great. So Beck ended up doing about a dozen projects for the magazine. She had an, an, a project in nearly every second issue. issue. So, which was awesome. And I thought, you know, she's going to be an embroiderer as well. And she loved her stitching. But then high school came along, work, you know, workload got heavy. And so she continued working with me in the studio, but she stopped stitching um, and just kept doing her drawing and things. So, <laughs> and then beginning of this year, I lost, oh no, oh, sort of, um, when was it? May this year, I lost her as an employee. Uh -oh. That she hmm. went off and got a job. So the nerve <laughs> so of her. She, she's finished. <laughs> I know she finished university. Yes, and she she um she got a job doing something that she wants to do. So she doesn't work with me anymore, unfortunately. So I want to go back was, to the was, boy. I want to go back to the boyfriend thing because I want to I want to hear how your husband. <laughs> <laughs> 
have I asked? But, well, by the time my husband came along, I wasn't working on big frames. Um, oh, okay. But I was working. I was working on tablecloths and things. So he was quite yeah, he quite frequently had a tablecloth sitting on his lap while <laughs> while we were dating. So. <laughs> and he he um, he's an engineer, and he was. Um, he is a noise and vibration expert, and at the time he was doing a whole heap of um, um, tests. He was in uh, brake manufacturing, and uh, we we did a lot of dating in test cars, where you know, you know, get it get it get it up to 100 k's and then brake, and then get up to 100 k's and brake, and so we'd spin. We'd spend the evening driving around and stopping and driving and stopping and driving and stopping. And so I, I was sitting in the front doing my cross stitch the whole time because I thought I can I can do cross stitch in the car, that's fine. So so I was I was doing cross stitch while we were doing that. Holy smokes, date date news almost frightening. Jeez. <laughs> Wow! People laugh. People laugh that I have embroidery in my handbag all the time, and they don't realise it's been there since my handbag was a school bag. So <laughs> it's just um, we had a my my niece had a hens party um, yesterday, and we had a really beautiful afternoon. No, day before, beautiful afternoon, and there was one of the things was a, a sheet. One of the games is a sheet to tick off about what you have in your handbag. And one of them was a sewing kit. I said, oh, sewing kit? I've got my embroidery in here. Does that count? <laughs> so uh, I, got, I got extra 15 points for having my sewing in my handbag. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Even though I didn't put a stitch in. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's always been there regardless of whether I'm, yeah, whether there was a boy around or not, there was always stitching. Hmm. That's amazing. And, and. <laughs> No, you don't have carpal tunnel syndrome or... Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, not yet. Oh, I broke true. my wrist. I broke my wrist to go. That was interesting. Oh, well, that must have just and, about killed um, you. <laughs> Jeez. No, no, I didn't. But it slowed me down a bit. And um, I... I already stitch with both hands anyway. I, I use my left hand and I try my applying felt and things, so I like to use my left hand because I kept thinking if I ever break my wrist, it's good to have your left hand in. And so I, um, I broke my wait wrist. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You <laughs> literally, you, like, you, you planned ahead for a broken wrist? This is scary. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, well, that was bad. <laughs> anyway, I, um, I did... I'm a bit of a tangle foot, so it was a it was inevitable that sooner or later I would probably fall over and break or break something. <laughs> anyway, I um so <laughs> I had a week before I was going to New Zealand teaching, and so in that week and in that week, no, so I had two weeks, two weeks. I had one week <laughs> at home, and then I had a week that we had a holiday booked, and then I was coming home for a holiday and basically getting on another plane and going to New Zealand teaching. I spent that entire two weeks, including the time on our holiday, um, doing a clean stitch on 32-count linen with my left hand so that I thought, right, I'll be able to teach some work from Goldberg with my left hand if I can do clean stitch on 32-count. So I clamped, clamped my work to the table and was sailing away with it. And, yeah, went off teaching and the writing is really not so good with my left hand, but the stitching is not too bad. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I was doing, I was doing monogram handkerchiefs for Christian Dior at the time, and I had three handkerchiefs left to go, and I had to have these three handkerchiefs sti stitched with my left hand to to send back. Uh, and um, I'd done, I'd done like a, I'd done, I had a hundred to do. Oh my! And I'd done ninety-seven of them when I fell over. And um, <laughs> oh jeez! <laughs> so, Sorry, that's so, not funny at all. No. <laughs> so they went back, and I went, you know, they last three up. Probably not to my usual standard, but they're as good as they're going to be. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, three so to go was... and I have to fall. Oh, geez. I know. It was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when when anyway. is it uh, – it just intrigues me. When is it that you realize you can make a living doing this? Uh, when your husband says you need to finger out and turn it into a real job or go out and get a real job. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, I'd been teaching and 
um, selling kits and I had a small mail order business and it was going along nice and then Steve said that to me and I said, well, I thought I was meant to be like a stay-at-home mum and he said, well, yeah, but the kids have started school now and you could be, you know, doing more and I said, oh, well, I'll stop saying no to work then because I was saying, oh, no, I think I've got enough work this month, you know, I was being very careful to not overcommit myself with two little kids. And so I just started taking off all over the place and then Steve started complaining that I was never home. Uh-huh. So, uh, Be careful what so you was, ask for. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. So, um, so yeah, it just kind of got, it got bigger and bigger and the more things you say yes to, the more your name gets out there. And, and so, yeah, it, it um, got sort of bigger than Ben-Hur and then my husband was, um, he had changed jobs and he had a we were building a house he had a very stressful job and it was stressful building the house and I said something's got to give (laughs) (laughs) and we looked looked at the finances and went you know what Beck Beck won't be with me forever and if you want to come and just work with me at home that'd be awesome and so Steve left his job oh and started working with me so it's um he's he's out in the shop right now manning this shop (laughs) So he's, um, I couldn't do what I do without him. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a, uh, uh, flipping that's of the tables switch. there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really, it's awesome because we're both a lot more relaxed. Sure. We're, we're, yeah, it's, um, we enjoy each other, you know, I mean, we, we've been married for 27 years. We've been together for eight years. So it's, um, you know, we we are enjoying being in our new house and enjoying the surroundings. We're in the bush. It's just lovely. And um, and so yeah, we we added a sh- when we built the house, we built a studio on the side and a shop area, classroom, and it's um, it's fabulous. And yeah, we're both a lot more relaxed. It's it's really good. Mm. We love working with each other. That's fantastic. Yeah, my wife and I work with each other. Uh, uh, we're magazine editors and um, work at home, and we're in in a converted bedroom, the two of us, all day long. Cool. And, uh, yep. and we, yeah, we enjoy working together, and uh, we just think it's the best arrangement on the planet. But uh, we've encountered more than one person who says, "I don't know how how you ever do that." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, I say for me, my mum and dad did it. My dad left left work to to work in mum's nursery, so you know oh. it was hers was the same thing. So you know, for me, it's it's not such a foreign thing. But I do get that some people don't get how you can do it. So it's yeah. um, yep. So yeah, I've got friends who I think would kill their husband if they were under there, you know, around <laughs> them all the time. So yeah, I, I, we know some people <laughs> like that too. Yep, yep. <laughs> The uh, and I was intrigued by the, the you built the house and the studio, and I didn't realize yeah. that that there was a shop as part of that too, a retail shop. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a the, the it's a small sort of retail shop with a classroom area set aside in it, so that I can teach from home. I said to Steve, you know, the the time will come when I'm not wanting to travel around the world like I am, and I just might want to still teach but not travel. And I said it would make more sense that while we're building the house to build a shop area and a, um, a classroom in so that when I – and I could start teaching from home now, we can have the shop open. So the shop's open two days a week and um, other days by appointment just so that, you know, if I'm away teaching, I'm not here. But if I'm home, I, you know, I had somebody pop in yesterday um, and um, who just wanted some fabric and she – had rang me on the Friday and I said, yeah, no, come, come Monday. That's fine. So, um, so no, it's, it's really, um, it's good. And it's just, it's, it's just ticking over nicely. It's not really, really busy, but I didn't expect it to be either. You know, it was, it was a long-term thing that when I, you know, it might be another 10 years before I just don't want to travel. So, you know, but it may in 10 years time, we might not be able to afford to build it. So, um, with the cost of everything going up like it does, yeah, yeah. So it made sense that while we're building the house, we build the studio. And we, I had a separate studio to the house at um, their last house, and so we we were always going to build a studio, but we we always had to have a storeroom. But we needed to look at what we thought we needed for the shop classroom area. So, um, so it was 
interesting when we went to get the house built, you know, trying to go around builders and things and they're like, you want two houses built? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much because my studio is about the size of my mum's house. So, so well, I, I wonder, it seemed like it was uh, uh, of some size and I assume that you have a, a design area for you, just a personal area too. It seemed like we, that you had quite a, quite a space there. Yeah, we do. The The personal area is more a work space, like for packing kits and things like that, not for stitching. I still stitch in the house, um, unless it's a day that the studio's open, then I just stitch in the classroom area. Um, but usually, um, if I'm designing or, or stitching or whatever, I still want to be in the house with Steve or if the kids are here or, you know, um, especially when the kids were here, it was, I don't want to be out on my own out in the studio when I've got a family. So I still use the kitchen table a hell of a lot. And at the minute, it's about well, six inches deep in needlework from one side to the other. <laughs> 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 Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, it, it's um, you know, yes, I have a beautiful big space that I could be working in, but then I'd need need to pack it up and come inside so that I can stitch in the night time. So I generally have something that's portable that I can take out and work on in the studio. Um, or, I, you know, have I've always got multiple projects going. I've got about five different projects on the go at the moment. So there's always something left out there to work on out there and something in the house, it's something in a handbag, <laughs> something in a frame. Sounds about right. <laughs> yep. And, so, and this, no, and this, this cool. stitching, this embroidery has taken you all over the world. Well, there aren't too many places you've missed. There isn't. No, it's been really amazing. So it's um, I'm very very fortunate. It's um, it's it's really um, I don't I don't enjoy airports and I don't enjoy airplanes, um, but I do love meeting people and I don't get a whole lot of time to look around the places where I am. Generally, I fly in and they throw me in a car and show me whatever's in their local area and then I teach for two days and fly out again. So I don't get a lot of sightseeing time in, but it's, um, it is really cool. And then I've had a couple of trips away where I've just gone away to do research and, and travelled. And um, so, no, it has taken me all over the world. It's really fantastic. I've seen more of America than a lot of Americans, I think. <laughs> I get, Probably. I get some people in my classes who done maybe three or four states and i think i'm pushing 18 to 20 so it's um it's yeah it's really it's nice meeting people yeah well yeah and, and to be able met, to met lots of really nice people right and to be able to see needlework in all parts of the world too yeah yeah it's just fabulous and i think um probably the best part it's kind of the worst part really but the best part is that you know you go into a museum like Lacademia in, in Florence, and you go in there and there's 10,000 people all trying to take a photo of the Statue of David, which, you know, and there's all these guards running around saying, no photo, no photo. And then you can go and look at an altar frontal from the, you know, um, 14th century that nobody's looking at. <laughs> you can have the whole altar frontal to yourself. <laughs> so um, I, I was in... Um, um, a, a different museum, um, the uh, San Giovanni uh, Baptistry Museum, in also in Florence, and uh, I spent three hours with 27 on away panels, and the guard kept coming in and just checking on me and walking out. And this man came in, an American tourist. He came in and he looked at me and looked at everything, and off he went. And he came back about a half an hour later and I was about another two feet further along. I'm sitting on the floor with all my bags around me and I'm <laughs> sketching and taking notes and photographing the pieces and photographing them um, close up sort of section by section in a grid So and writing down what's of importance in each grid so that when I go home I can study them without thinking, now why the hell did I take that photo? And so he comes up to me and he says, okay, so tell me what's so important about these that you're still here <laughs> and so and the and the guard was there and she was killing herself laughing that there's an Australian tourist telling an American tourist all about the Italian embroidery you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't see anybody else for the rest of the day so um oh. my husband and then children had had left me come back and checked on me about an hour later and I said no 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 I'll I'll catch you just go off and do your own thing and I'll I'll find you after the museum closes and um and then it was really funny. 
about six o'clock, I, I, the museum closed and I walked out and apparently the, the kids and Steve had bets going that I would be dragged out of there kicking and screaming. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, I can walk out on my own two feet. <laughs> so, but, uh. but, you know, so it's, it's exciting and wonderful, but it's sad at the same time. Um, you know, they, there's not, not a lot of information on a lot of these embroideries. There's no books to buy. You know, they've got this most wonderful collection of something that's so very, very special that, you know, there's only three sets of in the world and there's absolutely nothing about them and nothing written in English either. Oh. So, you know, if you, if you can't translate Italian, you know, on the, on the hop, you don't have a clue what you're looking at. So it's, um, it's kind of it's, – it's sad that not enough people are interested in the needlework for them to be able to put out publications and things like that. Um, and they say the ultra frontal at Lacademia is just such a special piece. It is, it has pearl work on it from 200 years before pearl work showed up anywhere else. Mm. So it's it's um, it's a very very special piece, and there's not even a postcard of it. Mm. So it's um, sad in that respect. Yeah, yeah. But it, for, it, for you, it easy. is very cool. <laughs> yeah, for you, very accessible and all the time in the world. Yep. <laughs> It is, yeah, it's really awesome. And I think the other thing that I'm really lucky with is that because I've, um, um, I guess, gotten famous, that I have I have a name in the embroidery world that now when I go places I can contact curators and say, you know, this is what I'm studying at the moment. Have you got this? Can I have a look at it? And usually the answer is always yes, you know. So it's... Um, it's really cool to be able to go behind the scenes and study things that people don't normally get to see. So it's, um, it's very special. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That makes any trip worthwhile. Yep. So do, do, do we stitch on, Oh, I'm asking you if you stitch on the plane, of course you do. Um, of course I do. <laughs> you, sti- you stitched in test cars. Of course you stitched on a plane. <laughs> never mind. Just never mind. Planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> Just never mind. <laughs> uh, I have a gorgeous little pair of silicon handled scissors. Um, they're so tiny, you're allowed to take them on planes. Um, and they, uh, they come with a little scabbard that's joined onto the handle. And so they, my, I never hide my sewing. It's always just in a clear plastic Ziploc bag shoved in my handbag. And the scissors are in there with it and the needles. And it just goes through security without any hassle whatsoever. I have a bigger hassle trying to get my shoes through. So anyway, <laughs> I, I, um, I get on the plane. Once I'm on the plane, the scissors come out. They go on my bra because <laughs> you, you know, they're so small. Yeah, they're easy. And they're so small. If you drop them, they disappear down the crack in the seat and you'd, you'd, you'd lose them so um but you say they're so they're small and they're soft soft handled and with a little little soft scabbard on them i just tuck them in and sometimes i forget they're there and i can fly in home at you know five o'clock in the morning and catch a bus back to ballarat and then spend the day here and <laughs> whatever and in the evening get undressed and go, oh what's that that's oh the scissors <laughs> 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 the contact was still there so yeah so it's um they're, they're really neat little scissors though they there's absolutely super sharp they're fantastic so once upon a time i used to travel with all my threads pre-cut so i didn't have to worry i'd just start with a waist knot finish pulling my thread through to the front of the work so you don't get tangled in it and then when i got to wherever i was going i cut out all of the um cut all the knots and the tails off um these days i just take my little scissors with me because i can right i don't have to get off my get off at the work looking hairy yeah (laughs) Yeah, I'm about to uh, uh, in a few days uh, fly to Germany, and uh, I already have my my uh, this time it's needlepoint uh, all packaged up and ready to go, and and uh, I have a, I upgraded the seat, and I've got a lap stand, and I'm just you know on the way because I don't do well awesome. on the, uh, flights up to four or five hours. I'm okay, but those long nine and ten hour flights to Europe uh, I struggle with, and so yeah, I'm I'm all set. Yep, and excellent. I, but I know the scissors you have. The ones I have are, um, uh, the, yeah, they have a plastic thing. I don't. But the, you, you have the ones that are atta- the little scabbard thing is actually attached, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're awesome little scissors. Yep. Yeah. So no, I, I've got mine all lined up. Yep, ready to go. 
I have to excellent. I have to get over the see it for me. It's the it's the male stitching uh, thing. So I have to get over that. But um, on a long long flight to Europe, I've discovered people just really don't care at all. No, <laughs> so, yeah, they're sleeping. They right. don't really. They're not even looking. Yeah. So. So, so the question is, do you take your magnifier and light as well? Yes. Oh yes. Because that's that's where I draw the comments. When I'm when I'm sitting there and I've got a headset magnifier and a headset light and and I'm sitting <laughs> and I've got the earphones on because I'm watching a movie at the same time, mm-hmm. multitasking and that's that's where I draw the looks and the comments. <laughs> it's like, yeah. can you stack anything else on your head? <laughs> <laughs> uh, now my my light is is a clip on that clips on to the lap stand, and my magnifier is on a string hangs around my neck. Uh, okay. But then, then I have yeah, I have uh, Bose noise canceling headphones, and yep. and an extra battery for the when that you know because it, it'll it'll die, and uh, yep. yeah, I sit there in my own <laughs> little world. Yeah, yep. yep. <laughs> and it's a great little world, I reckon. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Just leave me alone. <laughs> and and as Christine and I have talked about many times, uh, when you work in the business world, when you're on a plane is really the best time because they can't get to you. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Yep. Your phone's turned off. It's awesome. Yep. <laughs> yep. They can't get to you. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Book publishing. Oh. Book publishing. Boy, you you yeah. You dug your feet in when it came to book publishing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was kind of left in the lurch by a publisher, so I decided, well, let's publish it myself. I've been promoting it. I don't feel any fear in doing it so I'm ready to go and um, Steve felt fear in it because I was going to add a great big chunk of money onto our mortgage so he was a bit worried about it (laughs) and I said I said no look I can't see it being a problem there's no other book like it on the market I have people asking me all the time you know about project books and there were no project based goal work books at the time so everything was technique based and people would come to class and they'd learn how to do techniques and you know they could reference that back to their books and things that they had but there were no project books and the fact that any goal work design is really just a line drawing you could use any any basic line drawing um, and color it in and people just sort of didn't get that so I um I said well you know I've I had three different publishers saying that they wanted to publish me. And so I said, okay, let's do this. And um, I had friends who'd published books and they would tell me how, oh, God, you know, just being hassled and hassled and hassled until they've got everything done. And then they come back and say, oh, I don't want these three. I want another three and, you know, and want them by next week because we can all just right. turn out a piece of needlework that quickly, can't we? Right, yeah. And so... <laughs> So I decided I was in the box seat with three different publishers wanting to publish me. I would actually write the book first and then I'd give it to them. And then I was working under my own steam and I didn't have to worry about anybody pushing me and annoying me. And so that was fine and went to the publisher that I already had a a working relationship with and said that she was the one that I decided I would go with and, then she decided after a few months of backwards and forwardsing that she just really didn't have time to do it for maybe a year or so. Oh, my. It's like, oh, hang, um, hmm, that doesn't really fit in with what I had um, been working on. And so anyway, it, it went backwards and forwards a bit. And um, in the end, she said, oh, I just don't think I can do it. And I said, fine, that's all right. Thanks for telling me. And... Paul got home. I was I was at a, at an exhibition opening at the time, so I drove home, cried all the way home. <laughs> got home, pulled out the yellow pages, looked up publishers, looked up self publishing, made an appointment for like two days time, and had the book rolling. So um, I'd, I'd already arranged. Um, I'd been asked to be a feature artist um, touring interstate with craft and quilt fairs and promoting this book <laughs> which she then decided she wasn't going to do oh so, boy well you were really left in the lurch yeah yeah but it was I guess partially my own fault that I believed that she really wanted to do it you know um and she kept saying I'll send you a contract I'll send you a contract and never actually did so I guess probably in the back of my mind I was suspect of it anyway mm-hmm. so anyway it was awesome because it meant that as the publisher 
you know, the publisher is the person who puts the bill and takes all the risk, but it's also the person who gets the most profit out of the book as well. Right. So as as a publisher, I then built my first studio with profits from the from the book. Yeah. So, um, so I was really really stoked, and I really enjoyed the process. And by the time that book came out, I had the second book written. So yeah. that, that that came out rather, you know. Um, so the first one was two thousand six. Next one was two thousand and eight. Um, the third book has seven years of my life in it as far as research and things. So the Stumpwork Masterclass book took a bit longer um, and it was never going to be the next book. So the, the book that was going to be my third book got bumped and bumped and bumped and it's been bumped again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's the, that's the case anybody I've ever talked to who published a book through a publisher. The only way that they actually made significant money was if they were out uh, promoting the daylights out of it to sell copies yeah. that, that publishers are terrible at marketing uh, or or just don't have any interest. So if you self-publish it, you really put yourself in a strong position in terms of, of not only promoting, but then you don't have that percentage coming off the top every time. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, mean- to say I, I've, I know people who get forty cents from every book that go, that that gets sold, and it's like that's great if you're selling a ton of them. But if right. you're not mm-hmm. selling a ton of them, forty cents it's just not worth writing the book for. So, um, so for me, um, you know, I'm not doing huge volumes of books like Search Press would do. Um, but the, t- the subjects that I deal in is a very niche market anyway. You know, when you look at embroidery as, as okay, so if you look at hobbies and then you take embroidery out of that, you know, it's right. only a very small pr- proportion. Then you take gold work and stump work out of that proportion. <laughs> yeah. Those <laughs> of know. us who do stump work are a very tiny, tiny subset. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I'm, I don't think that, you know, there's any need to publish any huge mountain of, of books, of my books. The, the number that I'm printing, I feel comfortable printing. And, you know, um, they can go to reprint. So the, the first first book went to reprint. The third book went to reprint. Second book I printed too many of. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> you learn these things. <laughs> um, so... <laughs> Well, it just meant they didn't have to go to reprint. So, um, so no, it, it's been really good. And, um, yeah, fourth book we printed more of because we thought it had a wider appeal. So it's the Hints and Tips book. And um, I was talking to um, Sue who runs the, the, the sales side at Inspirations and she said, I can't believe that book still sells really, really well considering it's now now a couple of years old so um that one came out in 2016 and it still goes in the mail nearly every day so yeah that that book there uh, that's that's really a versatile book for anyone who stitches isn't it it is yeah yeah so it, it was um it come about through having students asking um you know all these wonderful things you say in class have you why don't you write them down and make a book <laughs> you know and it's like well, I guess I could, you know, and so it was. It, it was just sort of something that evolved. And um, at the time, I was president of the um, parents and friends at the kids' high school, and one of the teachers was running a media club, and he came in and was talk, giving a report on the media club and how he's got these kids doing posters and um, menus for local restaurants and things like that. And so my brain went, huh. I could do the hints and tips book and the kids could lay it out and we could do this. And my brain went into overdrive and I talked to him about it. He got excited and I went home and wrote three quarters of the book in one afternoon. Oh, jeez. Um, <laughs> and I then, I then carried a notebook around the class for the next two years to get the hints and tips that don't come out very often. You know, the, the putting your screw at 12 o'clock on your hoop comes out every class. You know, how to use dressmaker's carbon comes out in every class. Things like that come out regularly. But things, you know, when somebody accidentally cuts a hole in the background fabric, yeah. you know, the size of a dime, <laughs> fixing that isn't always, mm. 
that's not an everyday girl. Actually, that one that that happened just after the book came out, so that one didn't go in the book. Um, so, so yeah, volume so two. two years, oh yeah. So for two two years, I carried around a notebook and was writing down extra things and typing that in, adding them in. And when I discovered that everything I was had gone for a few months, that everything I went to add in was already there, I went right. It's finished. Um, but by that time, this teacher had left the school and the media club had fallen apart and oh. didn't exist anymore. And I went, oh, well, I'll just do it myself again. So so off we went again, self-publishing and doing it that way. So, and, yeah, it was really good. So, now, li- um, listener, listener Beth in Illinois is going to laugh when she hears this because I swore that – now, our, our last two guests have been Susan O'Connor and um, uh, Trish Burr. Yeah. And and so uh, after I bought three of Trisha's books, and <laughs> and uh, one uh, the the newest inspiration book and a print subscription to Inspirations. And so I said, all right, you know, we can't have a, keep having these guests because they're killing me. Yeah. And, right. Um, <laughs> uh, book sales. <fell. laughs> yeah. But I, I I will I will admit that before we recorded this, I was going to buy the the hints and. Uh, uh, tips and hints book hints hints and tips book but um i couldn't get it in the states so everything uh, do am i everything is all the books go through you is that how you do it i i have um there's a number of shops that stock them in in the states oh, okay and, um and there is there is um ruth kern books is also has been distributing in the past. I'm not, not sure whether she's still distributing, but I know she takes orders and gets me to fill her orders every now and then. Okay. Um, but no, I do have I do have a number of shops in in the states that do um, that do stock them. There's one in um, oh my goodness, I've gone completely blank. Ah. So basically, I didn't look hard enough. <laughs> No, yeah, you can you can find them Denver, Denver, Colorado. Oh, that shop, yes. And yeah, and there's one in Baltimore. <laughs> so okay, is it Baltimore. Mm, yes, um, can't think of the name of her shop now, but her name's Christine as well. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's um, it, it is available there. But yeah, most of the time, it's they're available through my website. They're available through Australian distributors and shops and things over here. They're available in the UK. I've got a UK distributor. Um, American distributors haven't been so excited to want to pick them up. Um, yeah. Don't know why, because over here the distributors love them, so they they sell really well. So, um, but you know, I, I ship them over the states all the time. Probably my biggest problem with them is probably the cost of shipping, because Can't while I like it. Yeah, but while I try to keep the cost of the books as low as I can, um, but when when the first book came out, they said, "Oh, this book should be selling at sixty dollars." The the crowd that I was using um, to do the layouts and that, and I said, "Yeah, that's really good, but a, a book that's sixty dollars won't sell as quickly as one that sells for forty dollars." So you know, we worked out the figures, and I said, "No, I can afford to sell it for forty dollars." So when people complain about the postage, I kind of go, "Yeah, but the." Books need to be twenty dollars dearer than what it is. So, like my fifty dollars book could be selling for eighty if you want to compare it with other books the same sort of you know size and content. Um, but so this is where do you do you have an eighty dollars book that you sell with free shipping, which everybody will just scoop up, or do you have a fifty dollars book with thirty dollars of postage, which yeah. people then go oh. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's what we're toying with doing is making the book dearer. For the, for the book I'm working on at the moment, the book might be dearer, but it'll come with free postage. So, mm. you know, mm. it's um, it's really weird. People don't seem to mind paying more for something if they're getting free shipping, even though it adds up to exactly the same figure. Right, right, yeah. Perception, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Okay, in, the, in, no. the hin- in the Hints and Tips book, three, your three favourite. What are your three favourite? Three favourites. Help, I stitched my embroidery to my skirt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> time to ask yourself how much you really like that skirt. Um, <laughs> um, um, oh, I don't know. Oh, it's always start a new project with a new needle. That's probably the biggest hint you can give anybody. Always start a new project with a new needle and needle the thread. Don't thread the needle, you know, 
have the tiniest amount of, of thread poking through from your, your fingers and take the, the needle mm -hmm. in between your fingers. It threads every time. When people tell me they can't see to thread a needle, I laugh. And I, I stand there in front of them with my eyes closed and thread the needle. There's a, eyesight's got nothing to do with it. <laughs> it's, mm. it's not having an inch of thread poking out from your fingers because the minute it hits the eye of the needle, the surface tension on the eye of the needle will make that thread bend. <laughs> so, it, you know, you, you've got to have just the tiniest bit of thread. It will thread just about every time for you. So it's um, no eyesight required. Yeah, so, but I have a needle threader, see? <laughs> <laughs> see, I never use one. I know, I know. That's something I have to go find. <laughs> needle needle thread is uh, not something I use. And then when I get to a needle that I do need a needle threader for, the needle threader won't fit through it, like a number 15 beading needle. Right, right. You know, exactly. and, and the big hint is if you need to thread a, 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 um, a number 15 beading needle to go through a particular bead, it's probably going to be easier just to poke the thread through the bead. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my students do that as well. So look, it's like, no, 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 no. Just take the needle off, thread the thread through the bead like you're threading a needle because it's actually easier than getting it through a 15 beading needle. Yeah, I suppose there is a, that point of no return on that. Yeah, just you know, yeah. <laughs> skip the needle. Yep. What's, <laughs> what's, yeah, the, a, a what's, the, what's the strangest hint that's in that book? Strangest hint? I Most, don't know. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't know. I, I think probably um, the, the one the ones that get the most comments is actually the hints on the classes section. So it's divide the book's divided up into um, so you know like get, getting started. You know you've never stitched before. What do I put my work bag through to general stitch hints through to hints for goal work, hints for stump work. Then um, particular. Um, particular problems that you might you know weird weird fudges things you know to, to fudges to fix things because I've always believed in fixing rather than unpicking I unpick if I have to but I'd rather fix it um, and then it's got hints for classes and people are usually and hints for, to, for um, taking photographs of your needlework as well and that's it's usually the one about the classes that gets the most comments because people think oh yeah, didn't think about taking a cushion because I usually stitch with a cushion behind my back. Oh. Um, you know, I, the amount of people who say, oh, I didn't bring, I've just got new glasses. I didn't bring my old ones. I'm not used to stitching with these. You know, if you've just got new glasses, take your old ones. Mm -hmm. you're, not used to your new, you're not used to your new glasses yet. If you stitch with a light and a magnifier at home, take them to class. Um, I've lost count of the amount of people who've said to me oh i usually stitch with a light and a magnifier at home oh, <laughs> it's like well, no. why have you not brought one with you <laughs> <laughs> um, you know for me if you usually stitch with your shoes off take your shoes off if you <laughs> usually stitch with your feet up grab a chair and put your feet up if you're not comfortable if you're not in your insane i mean in a classroom you're already not in your usual stitching environment anyway um, if you can try and make it a little bit closer to your usual stitching environment, you'll probably get more out of the class because you won't be busy squirming that your seat's uncomfortable <laughs> and complaining about the plastic chairs and, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, they're probably the, the ones that people say, oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. So, yeah. It's, um, so yeah, they're probably they're not weird, but they're just um, – they're probably sense. more – yeah, they're observations, so – um, and yeah, my, I guess my favourite in that section is don't get your requirements list out the night before the class. No. Oh. You know, and and don't expect the shop to have everything ten minutes before closing time the day before the class. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's funny how many people leave things to the last minute. Yeah, that's got to be one of one of a, any shop's biggest headaches is your you, there's a project coming up, people are lining up to buy stuff. But you, you, can't, you can't anticipate it, yeah. No, no. And you, you don't even like, – I've had a, a tutor contact me who is teaching for our summer school at Melbourne Guild, and she said, now I've put you down as a supplier. This is what I've put on the list as a requirement. So I said, thank you, so that I can mm. make sure I've got enough of everything. You know, it's um, 
I've got that and that and that's all in stock anyway, but I'll make sure I've got some extra as soon as you've put me down as a supplier. So um, it, it's it's handy when somebody gives you a heads up. Yeah. 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 Is 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 gold work material? You're going to have to come back because we haven't asked about gold work and stump work. So you're going to have to come back no. for another show because <laughs> we're about out of time here. But yeah, uh, no worries at all. Yeah, so we we got to do a whole show just on that. But is is gold work material getting harder to find, or is it just knowing where to get it? No, it's knowing where to get it. Okay. It's no harder to get than it's ever been. It's it's um. There's absolutely no issues with production. There's, yeah, you know, shops have generally never stocked it because at the end of the day, there's not enough. It's like we said before about publishing. There's not enough people doing it to warrant the stock shopping it. You know, it tarnishes before they sell it or they've got it on display and somebody comes along and goes, isn't that pretty, and squeezes it, crushes it, oh, then, it's <laughs> unsail- then it's unsaleable. So it's, you know, I'm... It's it's not hard to get, but you need you need to be able to you know it's got to, if you've got you want to support your local needle workshop, you go in and you say this is what I want. They can order it in. It's mm-hmm. it's not hard for them to get it, um, but there's just unless they've got a large number of people who are doing gold work, they're not going to they're not going to stop the threads because at the end of the day they're just going to discolor before anyone's even used them. So that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that gold work intrigues me, and, and I have to say I got uh, – you owe me about an hour of my life back because I got <laughs> sucked into your website, and, um, yeah, you owe me. But uh, You only lost an hour? <laughs> that's, that's because that's cause the phone rang. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't my choice. No, the phone rang. <laughs> but uh, – but we asked Mary uh, Corbett, you know, about gold work and how tough it is. And she said it really isn't. It's just uh, you just have to be patient and, and it doesn't go fast. And it intrigues me because what you do with that is just amazing visually. Yeah, I, 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 love, um, I love embroidery that makes you want to sit up and take notice of it. Mm. You know, you can, you can look at a cross stitch and go, yep, that's nice. That's pretty, you know. You, know, you can look at a piece of cruel. Yep, yeah, that's nice. That's pretty. A piece of canvas work. But then you get a piece of stump work or a piece of gold work, and it commands your attention because it's dimensional and it's sparkly yeah. and it's, you know, it just it makes you look at it. It makes you stand there and, and look at it. So, um, and even myself, when I go to exhibitions and things, I just went to the Bendigo uh, branch of the Guilds exhibition on Friday, and you know there's some really, really beautiful pieces on display, but the things that people stand in front of longer are the stump work and the gold work because mm-hmm. it, it really intrigues people about how you can make it three-dimensional. And especially with the gold work, they look at it and think, oh, my goodness, you know, I hate stitching with that strand of metallic thread. They just don't understand that it's not strand of metallic thread and <laughs> that it's really not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a bit of smoke and mirrors. So, um, you know, there are elements of it that are hard and there are elements that are dead easy. So, um, but it make it, it, I think it really intrigues people. I think the other form of embroidery that does that is Japanese embroidery. Um, oh, yeah. The, the yeah. Play, on, play on light of the, of the flat silks and things. It, it, it just gives it such a life um, that, that you just have to stand there and look at it. So they're probably yeah. the three most expensive things to get hooked up into as well. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had a, a lady at our Needlework Guild uh, come and do a program on Japanese embroidery. And it, afterwards, I'm sure I just stood there with my jaw on the floor because that is just mind-blowing what they do. Yeah, it's beautiful. Years and years of study too. Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't have the patience and I can't keep quiet. Apparently you have to be very zen and very quiet quiet and yeah. meditative and that's not me <laughs> <laughs> that one's out okay <laughs> uh, allison it's been a real treat thanks for making time yeah. for us really appreciate thank it thank you you're very welcome guys it's been lovely to spend time with you <laughs> yeah we've thoroughly enjoyed it thanks to everybody for listening and we'll be back on wednesday Bye.